Hey, Alex. Robbie, how are you, mate? Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. A lovely sunny day. Where are you, Los Angeles? I'm in Toronto. It it looks sunny, and it, I guess it is, but it's cold and miserable. Oh yeah, I like Toronto. Toronto's a beautiful city. It's cold and miserable in London. I think we have similar weather. It's doing a good impression of Raccoon City, actually, at the moment. London. It's dark. It's foreboding. But um, perfect. But yeah, it looks nice where you are. Hey, so um, a lot to talk about with your new movie, Resident Evil. Two words when put together, recognized the world over. When did you first hear the words Resident Evil? Oh, I played the original game. I was, I'm born in 88, so I was eight years old when it came out in 96. And I was probably a little too young to be playing it, but I played hockey and I played video games. That was pretty much my childhood. So uh, one of my earliest video game memories was playing in the basement in the dark and uh, dogs jumping through the window and scaring the living hell out. <laughs> I remember that. It's weird, and it's a testament to this film that watching the movie, I was flashing back to how terrifying that game was. Because wasn't there a bit where you you tried to, you didn't know what you were doing at the start, so you could open the front door, but the minute you opened the front door, two hellhounds stuck their head round and, like, barked the shit out of you. Yeah, I mean, the game has so many visceral moments that, like, stuck with me, probably because I was too young to be playing it, but, like, uh, it also tells you why the the franchise is so globally, you know, recognized and, and beloved. Yeah. I mean, you were young to be playing it, eight years old. So I'm a little bit older than you. So I was what? I was about 15 when I was playing and I remember it scared the hell out of me. Were you, did you have nightmares? I don't know. I'd have to ask my parents, but I sure as hell remember the dogs jumping through the window. Um, but I like, I liked that stuff when I was a kid. Um, so probably not a great idea to have been playing it, but, <laughs> but what are you going to do? Cause it was, it was, I, th I don't think any of us expected it, did we? Because I, it was one of the first like survival horror games that actually chilled you to the bone. Like before that, you know, we were jumping around playing Mario, like running mm -hmm. around colorful worlds. And then this game comes along and it just changed everything. Yeah, it did. And it, it's a little bit, uh, you know, if you if you really look at it, it's you might be able to attribute the you know comeback of zombies into pop culture to Resident Evil. Like they were big before that, obviously with like the Romero movies and stuff like that. But but Resident Evil, if you if you really look at the dates and the time, like they kind of brought zombies back to to the mainstream. And um, but it was definitely the first of its kind. It was the first video game I can remember that was. Like, you know, it's an action game, but it's a horror game. Mm. Yeah. And considering, like, how closely this film, the, the, the new movie, it resembles the plot of both Resident Evil and Resident Evil 2, did anyone, like, dust off an old console for you? Like, go, look, remember this? This was a PlayStation. Just so you could, like, relive the game. Well, great thing is, you know, I, I could play Resident Evil uh, 2 remastered on PC just because it was an easy, easy buy. Um, and, and I did. I ripped, I ripped around for a little while. I played a little bit of Resident Evil 1. Um, it's got the like PS5 backwards compatibility thing. And it's a diff it's difficult. Like it's the controls are dated. There's a lot of like turning around when you don't mean to turn around. Um, it, you know, it's games have come a long way but it was cool to play one and two because the sets and the production design in the movie are unbelievably accurate i mean mm -hmm. uh, johannes roberts our director went to capcom and asked for the blueprints to the uh the the spencer mansion and and the police station and he nailed it like the first time I was standing in, in the front entrance of the Spencer mansion, I was, you know, I was a kid again. It was awesome. <laughs> I bet. Did just, did you ever get round to playing resident evil? God, I think it was maybe seven or something. It was called resident evil biohazard. It was the one that came on the VR headset. So you were actually in the game. I have a, uh, a, a an ocular, like a quest two here. And uh, they just sent me a code for Resident Evil 4 VR. So I'm excited to rip into that. The only one I played that 
was like VR, but it wasn't VR. Was there was one on I think it was GameCube that had a gun that connected yeah. to the the yeah. console, and yeah. I think I ripped through that game in two nights. Like it wasn't it wasn't the most challenging, but it was a blast because it was new and fresh and something different. Man, if I don't know what Resident Evil Four on the VR is like, but Biohazard scared the shit out of me, like to the point where I had to stop playing. It was one of those. It was it was almost too much, but it was great. So as well as the games, though, you, like Resident Evil, obviously has been uh, on our big screen for on our big screens for like the last fifteen years at the hands of Paul W S Anderson and Mila Jovovich. Six movies, the last of which came out in twenty sixteen. Did you watch any of those movies either before or after finding out about this remake? I've seen every one. I'm a big fan. I, I think Mila Jovovich is amazing. My buddy Sean Roberts played Wesker in those movies. Oh, yeah. He played my older yeah, he played my older brother in, in my first movie I ever did. He's he's a great friend and and I loved watching, you know, him crush it in the in those movies. And I think those those movies are amazing. I think what's really cool for us is our movie is is totally different. It's actually, you know, an adaptation of Resident Evil One and Two. I think it's the movie that the fans of the games have been waiting for. Uh, and, and I'm excited for everybody to see it. I mean, if you grew up playing the games, you're going to lose your mind when you watch this movie. So when did you first hear about it, that they were planning this remake of Resident Evil, a reboot of the entire series? Was it a meeting? Was it a phone call? Did they send someone dressed as a zombie around to your house holding a contract? I got back to Toronto with my wife and uh, our son, who was one at the time and, and or almost one. And we were quarantining um, up at her parents' place because it was right in the middle of COVID. Sure. And um, my agent phoned me out of the blue and he was like, hey, I've been talking to Resident Evil about you. I didn't even know they were doing a Resident Evil. I was just in dad mode at that point. And he was like, I've been talking to Resident Evil about you. Uh, I'm going to send you the script. If you like it, meet with the director. And I was like, set the meeting with the director. <laughs> He's like, you don't want to read it. I'm like, oh no, I'll read it. But like, <laughs> I'm, I'm in, I know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I read it. And the great thing about it was, it was the version of the movie I was hoping for as a fan of the games. And then uh, I had a zoom meeting with Johannes and we just geeked out for an hour talking about, the games and the tone of the movie and what he wanted to bring to it, what he thought was important um, from, from a uh, uh, just a, a continuity standpoint of the games to the movies um, and where he could take some liberties. And, you know, after, after talking with him, I had so much confidence in the project and, and, and in, in him in, in making the film um, I was super pumped on it. And at the end of the call, he was like, well, I'd love to make this movie with you. So hopefully I'll see you soon. And I was like, okay. And <laughs> I hung up and I walked out to my wife and I was like, uh, I think, I think <laughs> I got it. And she's like, what? I'm like, I don't know. It was really, I don't know. And uh, sure enough, I was, I was the guy and, you know, uh, I loved working with Johannes. I loved working with the cast and, it was just kind of a dream come true for me. Because he, he, he's he been very clear like about how he wanted to really, like you said yourself, go back to the scares and the horror element of the original game. Did he give you any homework? As in like, look, have a look at these movies. You might have seen them already, but these are the kind of movies that are going to inspire the way I want to make this film. Well, I mean, we, we, we talked about the tone on our original meeting. Uh, he didn't give me any specific movies, but he was like, hey, man, if you want to go back and play the games, like you're going to really enjoy the version of the movie we make. And um, so I did that. I played through one and two a little bit and uh, and and really just, you know, kind of uh, just kept talking with him and, and figuring out what, you know, what was important and what were what were the big moments. And I thought what he did really well was if you just port the games over to a movie it wouldn't really work. There's, there's not enough there. Um, so I thought what, what was really impressive was how he took the characters and he took things about the games that people love. And then he added that connective tissue and these relationships between these characters and, and made them human beings and, and gave them flaws and, and made them so that you can watch them and see yourself in their reflection rather than just you know, kind of a little bit more of a, a one dimensional video game character. Mm. And uh, I think that's why, you know, everything else matters so much while you're watching it. 
I mean, he's done some great character work in the past. I don't know whether you saw uh, his shark movie, 47 Meters oh, Down. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So my biggest fear is sharks. That I have a shark tattooed on my wrist to remind me never to go in the sea because that's my biggest fear. So that scared the life out of me. Uh, did the sharks make your list of top three biggest fears? Are you cool with sharks? I'm not, not cool with sharks. <laughs> I don't want to. I like people swimming with sharks is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Um, I, I'll go swimming in the ocean, but I'm not going deep. And I'm sure as hell not going in the ocean where like where people are throwing food to the sharks to try and go swimming with. And that's not that's not my style. Um, but uh, I, I grew up on Jaws. Well, I, I mean, I didn't grow up on Jaws, but I grew up watching movies like Jaws, and uh, and that that took car- that took sharks out of the, out <laughs> of the uh, program for me. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you make a really valid point, though. I think the thing is that, like, with all with this idea of chumming to bring sharks in so that tourists can experience them, what you're doing is making the sharks closer to shore and also desensitizing them to the idea of like, oh, maybe I don't know what a human is. I might stay away. They're coming in. They're like, hey, food and humans go hand in hand now. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of your biggest fears? You're in like, uh, you know, one of the biggest horror franchises on the planet. What scares you? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> all the stuff that scares me is like really dark. Like it's just it's just real <laughs> stuff like health problems and like boring stuff. Like now that I'm a dad, I'm like <laughs> the stuff that scares me is like not even fun to talk about. It's just like. <laughs> really dark and, and, and <laughs> shitty. Um, but like, you know, the, 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 the sillier things that scare me are things like, you know, sharks. I'm, I'm not, I'm le- my wife is legitimately afraid of open water. We went, we went snorkeling once and, uh, it was like, just keeping an eye on her of like, don't freak out. Everything's fine. And she handled it really well. It was a, a it was a trip to uh, Oman, and uh, luckily we had great people with us and, and took care of it. But there was a moment where I was like, "Oh, this could go really, really south really quickly." <laughs> Uh, Robbie, man, I'm totally with your wife. I think there are actually sharks off Oman, and I, I would not go snorkeling there. You probably didn't tell her that. No, I did not. <laughs> yeah, I'm the I'm the guy who who I I. If I go any further than maybe about five meters off the beach, I have to, and it's this is pretty dark, but I have to make sure there are other people nearer. So like you don't have sh- to, so exactly. you don't have to be the fastest. You just don't, you can't be the slowest. I'm, I'm never going to be the fastest, but I'm out thinking the other people in this, in the sea. I'm like, they, they'll go you first. Know, you know where you should go because my wife being afraid of, of sharks in open water, but loves, like aquariums and, and underwater, like sea life. We went to the Georgia aquarium in Atlanta and you can swim in the big aquarium and there are sharks in there, but they don't go anywhere near you. And they're not like, they're not man eaters, but they have four whale sharks. <gasps> oh, wow. Swim around the top. And there's no danger with whale sharks. because They only eat uh, krill, but it's one of the most spectacular experiences ever so as somebody who is not going to go in the water scuba diving or snorkeling mm-hmm. make that a make that a bucket list trip for you that's a great idea that's a great idea i hope i can do it i mean i won't like even that sounds a little bit scary i i you know i can't have bubbles in the bath because i need to be able to see the bottom <laughs> in, in case a shark comes up so we're talking like you know this is next level fear but that sounds awesome and did you say you had done that or you did that with your wife or You've done it. We did that. Yeah, the two of us did it. Um, she had a freak out at first, and then everything was okay. But like the weird thing is, you're you're. We did the snorkeling, not or the, the snorkeling, not the scuba diving, because you can go down and swim with them. But like they literally told us, they're like all the whale sharks stay at the top and just do figure eight. So just do that, and you're you're just going around the tank, and these whale sharks come floating up to you, and they bump you, and then they <laughs> keep going. But like they're the most dinosaur looking things you've ever seen. <laughs> it was really cool. All right. That's my bucket list. That's number one. I've not had a bucket list till now, but you know, with there my fear go. of sharks, that's a good one. Now I'm right in thinking uh, Raccoon City from the movie. You actually were back in your home country. Uh, there was a, a town, an old mining town called, was it Sudbury? 
Sudbury, Ontario. I've, uh, I used to go there when I was a kid for hockey tournaments. It's about three and a half hours North of Toronto. Uh, we used to have bus trips out there. A lot of hockey there. Um, it's, uh, you know, nothing against Sudbury, but it was perfect for Raccoon City. Part of that is, <laughs> part of that is just the time of year. I mean, you go, you go anywhere in, in Ontario in November, December, and it's, you know, most of the time it's pretty gray and everything's dying and you get some rain and, you know, it's not an especially beautiful place to be. In the summer, I'm sure it's gorgeous. They got a bunch of lakes. It wouldn't look quite like Raccoon City. So did the part for us, but nothing, nothing against Sudbury. How weird was that for you, though? So you were going there as a kid to return there in a massive Hollywood movie, like with a lead role in it. That must have been, was that some sort of weird nostalgia, sort of memory lane trip? No, I mean, the thing for me was when I when I went on bus trips to Sudbury as a kid, like or for hockey trips, it was always on a bus. I was young enough that I wasn't watching the the road or like we were just hanging out watching movies in the back of the bus. And then I existed from the hotel to the hockey rink. You know, it was it was normally a game around six or seven, well, seven or eight in the morning and then a second game around three or four p.m. And then back to the hotel. It was like hotel rink food hotel rink food um so i didn't have much of a sudbury experience so this time around you'd think it would be a little different but it was covid so my my life was hotel (laughs) soundstage hotel location shoot hotel so uh, (laughs) i still don't know what's going on in sudbury (laughs) Oh, so you never got, I wondered if you had that moment, you know, where like, you know, as, as a kid, you're like, I'm going to, you know, should I do acting? Should I do hockey? I love both. Should, what what decision do I make? And then to have chosen acting and to return to the scene of your hockey match and go, look, I made the right choice. No, I mean, I was, I never thought of acting as a career. When I was a kid, my mom got me into like print work and little Sears catalogs and stuff like that for mm. uh, little commercials and just stuff because I was comfortable in front of a camera and I could put a little money aside for, you know, whether it be college or, or at the time it was like my sister and I needed a retainer or some kind of dental work. It was like not covered by the health plan. So, you know, that was where it came from. So, you know, I, I never thought of acting as a career. I never thought I would go to the NHL. I was pretty, um, I was pretty self-aware for a young kid. And I knew that in Canada, you've got a pretty good, idea if you have a pathway to the NHL from like 12 years old Hmm. so you know one of the guys I played with ended up going to the NHL um, but other than that everybody kind of found their other thing and then summer before 11th grade out of nowhere my modeling agent phoned me with an audition uh, for Cheaper by the Dozen 2 to play Eugene Levy and Carmen Electra's son and I just happened to look the part and book quit hockey and took it as my foot in the door and still had no idea if it was something that was going to work out for me, but I figured this was my chance. So I might as well give it a shot. And luckily it's worked out because I still don't know what I would do. (laughs) But there was, were there not some, uh, some nice, uh, I guess if you're, you're a believer in like, uh, you know, fate, there was uh, on cheaper by the dozen two, you had no lines when you got the part, but by the end of the movie, they'd given you some lines. Yeah, they gave me a few lines. I mean, the big thing was it was like the two families, right? So it was, I had to audition with fake sides. They were they were lines from like Tom Welling's character or something in the mm-hmm. movie. And then really it came down to a look thing. They wanted all the kids to look like they were, you know, fairly similar. And uh, the great thing was for me was I was the tallest kid. So I was always standing beside Eugene Levy and he just tried to make me laugh. Uh, every day like right before they yelled action because he thought it was funny if they if I was holding up production and uh, I just (laughs) learned a ton I just I I I really enjoyed the people that I was working with and um, I just kind of was like you know what this is an opportunity let me give it a shot if it doesn't work who cares you know it doesn't change anything and if it does work maybe I can run with this and um I ended up booking Life with Derek, which was a Canadian show that played on the Disney Channel that ended up, you know, getting pretty big for what it was and got me enough to, you know, get my visa and go to L.A. And looking back at it, 
now that I have a son, it feels like a big deal. Cause I would be like, what do you, you know, you can't just do that. But my parents were super supportive. We didn't have much money. So I just banked as much as I could and, and moved out there and tried to, you know, live as inexpensively as I possibly could and ate a lot of Subway sandwiches. And, uh, <laughs> And, and luckily, you know, it, it went okay. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say, but you, you, you went back to Toronto though. You never, did you, you didn't fancy staying out in LA, living in LA. You wanted to be back, I guess, where your roots are. No, I lived there since 2007. Um, first few gigs brought me back Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. But then I was like, you know, I had a place there since 2008. And um, my wife and I had uh, our son, uh, September of 2019 and we COVID hit right after and we spent a little time in LA then we came home to visit family and then that became a much longer trip than we thought it would and then uh, my show shoots in Vancouver my wife's show shoots in Vancouver so it was a lot of time in Canada COVID kind of changed the landscape of having to live in LA as an actor. And uh, we figure, you know, we can be closer to family and, and, and raise our, our son here. But at the same time, we kind of go where the work is. So until he's of the age where he needs to, you know, set up roots in a school, it's kind of like, okay, well, we can, we can figure this out wherever we go. So it's Toronto, it's Vancouver, it's LA, it's wherever the work is. I mean, I love Toronto. It's a it's a really beautiful city. I, I, weirdly enough, considering what we're talking about, um, my experience of Toronto is a, it's absolutely freezing in winter, and b, it was the strangest experience. I shot George Romero's uh, Land of the Dead. I played a zombie in George Romero's cool. fourth Dead movie, which shot in Toronto, and it was the coldest I've ever been. Two in the morning in December in Toronto. And the, the funny thing was, and I wonder if it had to, you had to do this on, on Resident Evil, we had to hold our breath, like as a zombie, because obviously zombies are dead, and you're sort of shuffling towards the cast, and they're like, just make sure you hold your breath, otherwise we're going to have to remove the breath, but, and we don't oh, have the budget to funny. remove the breath. You know, most of our most of our zombies are interior scenes. There's not a ton of exterior zombie fights it's like in the police station it's in the mansion it's it's in the you know uh so so maybe they did but but i don't remember it being a, a big thing but it makes a lot of sense like you can't have a horde of zombies coming over with a cloud of, <laughs> of, of exhaust coming out so you're playing chris redfield in the movie um who literally didn't even show up, I don't think, till movie number four in the uh, the previous franchise yes. uh, when Wentworth Miller uh, shows up in a sort of... It, it's, I mean, he's great in it, but it's sort of like that weird homage to Prison Break. You're like, he's in a prison and he was in Prison Break, but here he is. Um, so how do, you, how do you get yourself into the headspace of, of a character like that? Is there something you put on? Is there something... You know, I, I understand it's a video game character, but like you said, you're fleshing them out while honouring the character themselves yeah a big thing for me was you know if you pull the character straight from the video game he's a little bit flat it would be you know this small town super cop who's by the book and um it's not very it's not a very human character it's mm. a video game and i love chris redfield i've you know i've played as him i've i've you know pretended to be him while i'm playing you know i was a kid and um the big thing I, I spoke to with Johannes, which was not only for Chris, was for all the characters, was finding, you know, that balance of the game mixed with a grounded reality and, and a, a, a human version of this character. And I think a nice thing about Chris is you, you see this guy who's kind of a small town hero, but, you know, he's got regrets and, and the way that he handled things with his sister and he doesn't have much of a family left anymore and he's you know he's not a happy guy he's a little bit angry he's he's a little bit hurt and he's defensive when you first meet him um but he still has that you know wants to help everybody wants to be the hero um and and you get to see him build that relationship back up with claire and and try and you know try and make things right and i think the nice thing about that is you can 
you can people can see themselves in that character. It's a little more, you know, multidimensional um, while still staying true to, I think, you know, a version of the the character from the games. Well, that's I guess that's the interesting thing, is it? When you say uh, when you say staying true to a version of the character from the games, because you know, you know, strangers to playing characters that have an existing fan base, you know, from the Arrowverse, you know, Firestorm slash Deathstorm in the Flash. Uh, how does taking on a character like Chris Redfield compare to, say, Firestorm? There's a lot of similarities. I think you know, with Firestorm, there have been more iterations or or more. He's been better documented through comic books. There's been more, there's more to pull from. Hmm. Um, you know, a lot of the Chris Redfield stuff is like Resident Evil wiki and stuff hmm. like that. And, you know, uh, the games too, from 96, you know, video games weren't like novels back then or like, like comics, comic books. It was most of the game was being played as Chris. The cutscenes are very short and there's not a whole lot, you know, in them. So I think it's just, making sure that at least for me as a fan of the games, making sure that what I'm doing still feels accurate to the character I grew up, you know, playing as and, and watching well, building out some stuff that works for the movie. And that's where you take the liberties and you hope that, you know, it's something that people get behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, I, I think, the nice thing was uh, Johannes is so passionate about the games and is such a fan. We were on the same page when we were talking about it. You know, we weren't taking any weird, wild swings with the character. It was like, this is a, you know, this is a real guy. And, and, you know, he's, he gets scared when there are zombies, but he's trained. And that's when, you know, muscle memory and reflexes kick in. But at the same time, you know, if you're playing the video game, you know, there's a zombie coming, you know what you're getting into, you know, Chris Redfield in the movie has never seen a zombie before. The first time this happens, this is something new. This is something weird. And this is something really messed up. And getting to play with that uh, is really cool. Although, like, I think it is almost a shot for shot remake of the game. The first time you see a zombie is the turnaround zombie from the video game. It's so that's, good. That was the is. first. That was the first shot I I shot with a zombie. The the it was my first zombie scene in the movie, which was great because it's my first zombie scene in the video game. But like that moment of the white coat just turning back around, <laughs> so awesome. And and I like that there's fear there because it's it's a messed up situation. But mm. you know, uh, it was fun. I mean, obviously, you know that you like you say you're on a movie set you've got actors playing the zombies do, do you still like sometimes like in the dark of spencer mansion do you get the heebie-jeebies when you see all these stunt people dressed as zombies no i mean you there's so many people around and like in between takes they're like you're you know your zombies drinking a coke it's like <laughs> yeah. it just kind of sucks the fear out of it watching a movie is way scarier than making a movie the great part about the zombies were you know most of the time they were stunt players so they were stunt men and women who were there to you know go for it with the action which was great because you know the zombies in the game are pretty slow ours aren't 28 days later fast but they're not they're no slouch so I think what was really cool was finding that middle ground of like staying true to the, the games as far as the zombies go, but also, you know, heightening a little bit, making them a little scarier, a little faster, a little more dangerous. I guess they would have to be stunt people because you get into some close quarters action with these zombies and weirdly like true to the game. Whereas uh, Claire is great with firearms. Chris is great at taking damage. And there are some situations where you're like, Oh man, is he going to get out of that? I don't know. I look like I die a few times in this movie for sure. <laughs> I barely, I barely get out. <laughs> so, what was it like? Did you, did you actually? Were you sort of? I mean, was it choreographed? I, it must have been choreographed. Some of the fight scenes. Did you, did you pick up any injuries in those? I had a really nice gash after the when I'm at the bottom of the stairs, and the the three zombies kind of swarm me, and I'm holding them back. One of them 
uh, got a fingernail into my arm and it was about that long, but I had so much fake blood on me. You couldn't tell until I washed up that day. And I was like, Oh boy. And, um, I had a, I had a, a nice scar. It's just faded in the last little while, but it was about that long, uh, from there to there. And it was, uh, it was, it was, it was nice. It was, it, it was a little chunk out of my arm, which was, that was my only battle wound. Um, other than that, I mean, everything was choreographed. It was always choreographed. The, the fight scene in the dining room with the MP5 and the nine millimeter, I had uh, led lights on the end of the gun that lit up the, the fight scene, which was just kind of a dream come true for me from an action standpoint. And uh-huh. we, we, we choreographed that thing. It was myself, the stunt coordinator and, and like 10 stunt players dressed as zombies. And, uh, that was, I mean, that was awesome. That was, that was living the dream for me. I I'm so pleased you mentioned that. That's my favorite, um, action sequence in the movie. Oh, it's, thanks. Yeah, no, it's so cool. Cause it's, um, it's that combination of horror and kick-ass action, like in, in perfect harmony, just the bits where it's the flare from the muzzle of the gun that lights up the zombies' faces when you're firing. It's f- fucking cool, man. Thank you. Well, the second I read that, I was like, "Oh, this is so cool!" And I, so I came in uh, for work, and it was a. Uh, we spent one day choreographing it and rehearsing it over and over and over again. We sent we spent another day shooting it, and it was. I got to do the entire thing myself the stunt players just like totally laid out for me, made me look like a, a, a badass, which was awesome. And I really appreciate that. And it was, that was really, really fun. That was a highlight for me. So of all the Easter eggs that are hidden in this movie, and there are a, a lot, was there one that when you saw it, especially as a fan of the game that you were like, oh, I cannot believe the attention to detail there. There's a couple. One of them I almost missed was the the picture behind me in the dining hall of the the knights uh, uh, that were in the game. If you press X on it, it actually like zooms out and describes the phone, the painting. Somebody picked that off day one when the trailer launched on on Instagram. I was like, damn, good for you. And then um, the the in the uh, laboratory, the herbs in the background, the red and green and blue herbs. I was just yeah. like. They're never touched, uh, never touched, never talked about. I'm just like, this is cool. This is just, this is necessary, but it's cool. Were you, were you not tempted to, I mean, I guess, I guess being in the movie, you're allowed to do it. Were you not tempted to just go, I'll take a photo of that. I'm going to have that for the memory bank. A I, photo t- of that. I took a photo of the herbs. I think I posted it, probably shouldn't have, but I posted <laughs> it or I sent it to, I just sent it to like my brother-in-law, two of my buddies. Um, uh, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm so, sad i didn't take one of my flak jackets um if if we get a sequel i'll be swiping one of those they're very cool a very good like uh, uh, you know again another accurate representation of chris in the game i mean yeah. you mentioned like how um someone spotted the, the the painting behind you um the first time the trailer launched that sort of level of fan scrutiny it's that sort of on your radar are you aware of that is it is it detrimental at all to sort of feel under the microscope when you're playing a role that people are going to be looking for any, I guess, deviation from what they want because they're fans? I think, you know, in I have found that this is all subjective. My business is subjective and you can't please everyone. It's funny. I've done projects that, you know, are great that, some people have slammed and I've done projects that I didn't think were great that some people are like, that's my favorite movie. So I'm like, okay, that was for you then. And that wasn't for you. So the thing about this is I, as a fan of the games feel really good about what we made. That doesn't mean it's going to be for everybody. There's people who have different ideas of Chris Redfield or Claire Redfield or, you know, anyone from the game and you can't please everyone but I feel good about we made and what we made. And at the end of the day, I mean, that's all I can do. Right. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's probably a healthy way of looking at it. I mean, this, I guess that's what I mean. Like if you are constantly going, Oh, but can we, can we do that? Then you probably stop having fun creating a character, which you are owning for the film. I think the nice thing about it is you get the good and the bad. So there's always going to be trolls. There's always going to be negativity. 
but you also get the passionate fans who love it and are super, you know, there for it and back it. And, you know, those voices you hope are louder than the others. Yeah. And I think that's the best way of looking at it. I think it is. So we've not really touched on the zombies uh, in this movie, um, but I think it is worth noting them because there's like we met, you mentioned fast zombies earlier. You got your World War Z zombies, you like you said, the 28 Day Later zombies. You got your classic George Romero zombies, the slow zombies. These zombies are slightly different, though. Uh, Johannes has done something different with these zombies, hasn't he? Yeah, I you know I think they're a heightened version of the video game, um, the the regular zombies, and then the liquor. The liquor is pretty spot on. Like the liquor yeah. is straight out of the video game. But I mean, the zombies, the problem if you make them too slow is it can feel a little easy. Like, you know, the, the video game is very close quarters. So, but you can still run by zombies at times. And it would be a pretty boring movie if you could always just run by a zombie and not really have to worry about it. So I think there are liberties you have to take just from a filmmaking standpoint to keep the stakes high, keep the danger high. And I think that Johannes did a really good job with that. I mean, the tone never felt anti the games to me at all. Mm. It always felt like it was games first, but still, you know, made sure that it felt like a movie because at the end of the day, we got to entertain. Mm. And it's, there's a, there's something that I really, I quite liked is the fact that, you know, you see a lot of zombie movies where someone's bitten and then bang, they're a zombie within five minutes. But in this, the townsfolk of Raccoon City are sort of slowly becoming zombies. And the reason I found that truly horrific is because you can still see the humanity in them. Like when they're at the police station gates, it's like, it's like a person knowing they're turning into a zombie and unable to do anything about it. How dark is that? It's so dark and it's sad, but it's, again, it's that thing where it's like, it adds another layer. It grounds it a little bit. It makes, it makes everything, it makes you feel a little more if, it, you know, humanizing things, I think is a big, uh, a big part of this movie versus the video game. And, and I, you know, I, 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 I think that's what makes it, makes you care more about the people you're watching. Hmm. There are, I mean, it's, I loved it. I, one of the reference points I had in my head was John Carpenter's The Fog. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's like this really, like it's a slow building sense of dread in this mm -hmm. film. Um, but there are moments of levity uh, provided by uh, yourself uh, and uh, Avan Jogia, uh, which is nice. I mean, you're obviously a great comic actor. I was a huge fan of Upload, by the way. I thought Thank that was, you. Um, I thought it was fantastic. Thanks. When it comes to bringing humor to something like this, how tricky is it? Because obviously, you know, you do want to add a bit of levity, but at the same time, you know, you can't dilute the horror. You know who I thought did a great job? It's not a horror show, but but it was a very dark show it was Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad had humor that made the drama and the 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 danger just hit that much harder. And uh, I I think you know, I think the, the the fact that the movie takes place in the 90s helps with an innate charm and and uh, a place to use levity in the music and in like the Palm Pilot, just the like just the <laughs> silliness of like him playing Snake on his phone, like shit like that, where it's not laugh out loud funny, but it is. You're right. It's a it's a certain amount of levity, which helps with everything else those those lighter moments make the darker moments hit that much harder yeah you back foot the audience so they're like they relax and then whammy there's uh the liquor and um, it's been a pleasure talking to you robbie uh congratulations on the movie i i, I very much enjoyed it and um and I, I you know i think it's um i think it's gonna make a lot of fans very very happy i hope so thanks a lot man i appreciate it Hey, no worries. You have a great rest of your day. Take care. You too. Also, um, uh, yeah. Uh, uploads coming out in February ish. Oh shit! Really? Yeah, we finished oh. the second season. I just watched it. Uh, seven episodes. It's really, really, really great. Uh, the finale is. If you thought the finale of season one was good, wait till you see the finale of season two. Mate. Oh, I can't wait. Thank you for thank you for doing my job for me and answering a question <laughs> that I didn't ask. That's really good to hear. I love that. Thank you very cool. much, Robbie. You take care, buddy. Thank you. You too.
Hello, Alex here. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with us at all for any reason, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at JTFpod. And don't forget to subscribe to the full audio podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods.